Let's begin, as we always do, with Policy Kit. So what is Paul Kit? Well, it's short for Policy Kit. And it's a package for privilege escalation of the good kind. Good, well, normally, mostly good kind. That is, when you want to do something, and you want to do that something as another user, let's say as root, uh, this is a tool that lets you enter a password and then do that thing as another user. The most common use case is elevating the super user to do something. So if you're familiar with typing su to sudo and do something as root, uh, you may find it much more attractive to type a lot more characters to do that. So instead of typing a su, you can type all of this. The advantage is you get a beautiful graphical uh, authentication dialog if you have graphics. If you don't, you get a prompt for the password, etc. So, so why do we have this? Why is SU not enough? Well, not everybody can sudo. Uh, and this uses a, a, uh, a nice way of managing all of the different privileges for all the different stuff. And so, for example, here I want to cat the contents of Etsy Shadow. That's the shadow password file. And normally, you don't want people to see the shadow password file because it might contain weak passwords and someone could get the encrypted passwords and crack them. Uh, and that would be bad. But uh, And so you'd block that off. But I might be able to use policy kit to escalate to root and then cat that out. Nothing wrong so far. In order to accomplish its mission, Policy Kit has to change your user ID, change your effective user ID. Your real user ID is whatever it is. Let's say your user ID is, is 250. It's going to remain 250. But your effective user ID could be set to zero. What is zero? Well, that's the user ID for root. And that lets you do all kinds of stuff. To make all this work, PKExec is what is known as a set UID executable. Set UID means that a special bit is set on the file, which you can't set, you know, all on your lonesome because the file isn't owned by you, it's owned by root. And what that says is when someone runs this file, and the little S over here. See the little S there? When the set UID bit is set, go ahead and switch the effective user ID to the file's owner, and in this case, that's root. And so just doing an ls-l, we can see that the set UID bit is set, and that the file is owned by root, which means when we run it, it will run as if root had run the file. We can also run the file command over it, and that will tell us some other stuff. Namely, it will tell us it's a set UID file. Okay. And that takes us to PwnKit, a vulnerability. Uh, and so here's the description. The Qualsys research team has discovered a memory corruption vulnerability in PKExec. That's a set UID program that is installed by default in every major Linux distribution. Easily exploited vulnerability allows an unprivileged user to gain full root privileges on a vulnerable host by exploiting this vulnerability in its default configuration. Well, I want to do that. I'm sure you want to do that. Let's all do that. So there we go. So this was uh, uh, reported in January of this year. Going back to what we talked about last time, a weakness in a system is a point where security is weak. It could be poorly designed. It might be poorly executed. It might be fragile. Uh, and by fragile, I mean maybe it depends on external circumstances, and those might not be true. A vulnerability is a weakness that can be exploited by a threat actor. That's an attacker. Fancy name for an attacker to cross privilege boundaries within a system. It's a privilege boundary. Well, you could think of your system as consisting of lots of little subsystems. 
and some of them trust each other and some of them don't trust each other and crossing one of those don't necessarily trust boundaries that cross the trust boundary within the system. For example, if you can get from an ordinary user running LS to suddenly being the super user running the kernel, you have crossed a very important privilege boundary within the system and should send me an email with your exploit. An exploit is a specific combination of techniques or tools that when you combine them with the, with the weakness that will allow a threat actor to cross the privilege boundary within the system. It actually does the work of breaking the security. And remember, vulnerabilities and exploits require each other. Right? It's not a vulnerability until there's an exploit, and you don't have an exploit unless there's, a, there's something, uh, there's a weakness there that you can exploit, and that becomes a vulnerability. And I didn't mention computers in any of this. Right? I didn't mention computers. A weakness might be that you have a wooden frame door uh, and the vulnerability is that when I kick it, the wood breaks, and so the exploit is kicking it. Typically, you want to kick right next to where the doorknob is, and that will, uh, if you think about the door frame, it's a fairly thick piece of wood, but where you have cut into it uh, to uh, let the uh, latch go in, the wood on either side of that is much thinner, maybe the weight of your finger. And so a good solid kick doesn't have to break the entire door frame. You just have to break that one part of it, and then you can walk on in. I am not encouraging you to kick doors in. Uh, I'm just saying that's how that works. Uh, so maybe I patch that vulnerability by putting a metal frame door in. And then you have different problems. But anyway, so I didn't mention computers, and this could apply to these, these definitions as I've given them to you might apply to physical systems or combinations of, of systems. So a weakness can exist, but without a known way to use it, it's not a vulnerability yet. A vulnerability implies is a weakness and an exploit. And multiple weaknesses of different components can be combined to yield a system level exploit. Okay, keep that in mind. Multiple weaknesses of different components can be combined. We know there's a vulnerability in PKExec so we might ask, what's the weakness? Vulnerabilities commonly arise in, in several places, and, and here are the three that I think are most important, where one system or component interacts with another, right? And that could be an API call, or it could be me transmitting information across the internet, or it could be me yelling to someone down the hall. Okay, I'm yelling my password to someone down the hall so they can log in as me, but someone overhears it and writes it down. Uh, so where a human interacts with a computer, opportunities for vulnerability, writing a password on a post-it note is a good example, where you call uh, uh, API of a system another place. Where one system or component interacts with another, you should look for vulnerabilities. Where the entire input space is not considered, okay, uh, I'm entering data in your application, and just for fun, I enter negative one for a number of something. And your program does something weird. Maybe it, it prints out information I shouldn't have access to. Maybe it gives me uh, uh, additional privileges. Who knows? And the third place that I like to look for this is where there is a convention that is assumed but not enforced. And let me just say computers are full of conventions that we all assume but which they do not enforce okay there are lots of those if you take the reverse engineering class we'll beat on those till you're, you're sick of them so those are three places to look for uh, vulnerabilities so here's some code this is in fact the code from policy kit taken from their github page that contains the weakness that will be part of the vulnerability. Can you spot the weakness? And so I've dropped a bunch of lines of code. And I've just sort of got the highlights here. You can go look at the code itself. I've linked to it there. It's been there since this was first written 12 years ago. <laughs> so it's been in there for a while. And what is the weakness? So we look at it and we see that we walk over the command line arguments. We look for help. 
as we're doing it. We make sure that the last thing points to null. So this might he right here is something interesting you might think about. Uh, the command, people don't tend to think about the command line arguments that much. This is the number of them. And it includes uh, the first one, which is by convention, the name of the program that's executing. And so if I take one command line argument, I'll typically have two things in argv, the name of the program and that command line argument. But I'm sure you all know that. What you may not know is that the argument list is actually terminated by a null. So let's say I take one command line argument. I look at argv0, that's the name of the program. Argv1, that's my argument. And argv2 will be null. So uh, if I don't have argc for some reason or I can't trust it, I can always walk over this and look for null. And sometimes that's the right thing to do. So I make sure that I have a null at the end, which, you know, I, that's an assertion I can check. I then duplicate the path for argvn, which is the one that I, the last one on here. Uh, if the path is null, well, I'll go do some stuff. Otherwise, I see if it's an absolute path, if it begins with a slash, that's an absolute path on a Linux system. If it doesn't, I look for it in my search path. And I get rid of path and I set argv in and path equal to this string down here. And, and so now it's set to be wherever I found it. We're, we're good. We plow on through it. And some of you are concerned about this. This is not a problem. This thing is going to allocate a string for me. So allocation is taken care of. And so all that's good. Where is the vulnerability? The vulnerability is up here. It's right in here. Suppose argc is zero. But wait, argc would never be zero. It's always going to be at least one because argv zero is going to be the name of the program. And so therefore argc will be one because there's one thing in argv. But what if there's not one thing in argv? What if argc is literally zero. In that case, I'm going to set n equal to one. I'm going to check for it being less than argc, which is not, right? One is not less than zero. So this fails and I immediately terminate the loop. I don't do any of this, right? Only thing I, only thing this does is set n equal to one. And so now I come down here and I check to see if argv of one is null. And it, if it's null, that's good. And then I start doing stuff with argv of n. This is argv of, z, right? argv of 0 is null, which it will be, right? The, the 0 thing will be null because there's nothing in argv. But this would never happen, right? Because it always has to have the program name in it. Doesn't it? I mean, how did the program name get there? Did the... Did, we might assume the, the operating system puts it there, right? The operating system invokes the program. So it must be the thing that, 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 puts the, that puts the program name in there. Only it's not. Not directly. The process that starts this puts that in there. And maybe it doesn't have to. So here's an example. Here's some code. Uh, here's my main. I don't care. I just put void in here. And then what I do is I create my argument array and it has one entry and that entry is null. So this is a properly null terminated argument array consisting of zero arguments. And then I do exec v. What is exec v? So exec v says to overwrite this process with the image from here, pkexec, and I give it my argument list, and here it is, argv. But wait, what's argv0? Well, it's null. Now, the when I invoke this, the system is going to count the things in argv, and it turns out it's going to count 0, because the first thing is null, and it's going to then invoke pkexec 
with an empty argument list and arg c is going to be zero. Nothing enforces the first argument having to be the command line. That's a convention that I am perfectly willing to ignore. So it's in fact easy, it's very easy. So uh, sometimes people ask, why isn't there a fork? Well, I don't want a fork. You fork when you want to keep your process running and have a subordinate process do something. I don't want that. I'm going to over, and exec just overrides this with the thing I load. So I don't need the fork. Okay. There you go. So what, you say? So what? Fine. I'm willing to believe that you can get me here with argc equal to zero. Who cares? What is it? And I see that the loop doesn't run and n is set to one, but. But what does it matter? Well, look down here. I do g underscore stirdup. That's from the g in your library that it's using. It's string duplication. And I stirdup argv of n. Now, wait a minute. That's argv1. But there isn't an argv1, right? Argv0 was null. What the heck is argv1? Anyway, I duplicate that and stick it in path. What the heck is that? Is this just a, a buffer overflow? Well, yeah, it is. But what's actually there? Does what's there matter? To figure that out, let's talk a little bit about the process stack. So I've represented the process stack over here on the right-hand side as a collection of the stuff that's on the process stack. So over here is the top of memory, whatever that means to you, the highest address of your virtual address space. Not the real memory. Real memory is, a, is not a real thing. Virtual memory, that's where you actually have memory. So top of memory, there's some stuff here. Uh, but let's go down here to the stack pointer and talk about what's on the stack. Working from the top of the stack, which is paradoxically at the bottom of the figure, down it through the stack, by which I, of course, mean up through my list. It's weird, I know, but it's conventional to put the top of memory up here, put high addresses up here, put low addresses down here. We just think of stacks in the wrong way. Um, so the first thing at the top of the stack is the argument count, argc, and that's a D word. It's probably stored as a Q word, probably stored as eight bytes, but we really just use the four bytes uh, of an int as argc. That's our argument count. What's below it? Well, argv zero would be below it, and that's a pointer. So that would be eight bytes pointing to a string somewhere. Where is the actual, where are the actual bytes of that string? It turns out they're probably up here. Okay, they're probably up here in your process space. All right. What's below that is argv1 and 2 and so on, up to argv of argc minus 1, followed by the null pointer. Okay, there we go. This should make sense because C array should make sense to you. This is how an array of character pointers, which is what argv is, how they work. Okay, so what's past that is envp. What the heck is envp? It's your environment variables. You may not have known this, but when your process starts up, it gets a copy of the environment, all the different environment variables. Where do they live? Where do environment variables live? They only live here. Okay. When you set an environment variable, you are setting it in the running process of the shell. Okay, how does that get to another process that you start? It, the shell passes all the environment variables on the stack, and the new process usually caches a local copy of them. It copies them out of here because there's no flexibility here. It copies them elsewhere so it can add to them and modify them. So you get a full environment. I mean, where did you think they lived? They, how would you get to them? Right? They turns out. You get it, every process gets a copy of them, and that's how they propagate. It's kind of weird. 
Well, what about running processes and you change one? How does that change propagate? It doesn't unless you make an effort to make that change propagate. All right, enough ranting about environment variables. Let's go up here. Past that, right, this, by the way, this is another neural terminated array. We don't get a, a count of them. We just run until we get to the terminating null. Past that is the first auxiliary vector. What are those? Well, uh, those are those take the form of 16 bytes. Eight bytes of them specify the type of auxiliary vector, and then eight more bytes specify the content of the auxiliary vector, and they contain stuff. They contain information from the from the file that you loaded. They contain uh, just a broad variety of stuff. If you want to see them, you can paw through your stack and, and take a look at them. And you'll know when you reach the end of them because they are terminated by a thing called an AT null. That's two nulls in a row, two eight byte nulls. So null, null, null pointer, null pointer. There you go. And then you've reached the end of the well-defined part of your stack right here. And what's after it? Stuff. Uh, and that may include the actual bytes of the environment variable, things pointed to by this, the actual bytes that make up the string settings, etc. There you go. So that's what's on a normal, healthy stack. But we don't have a normal, healthy process. We set our argc to zero and passed a null as the only thing in argv. What does our stack look like? It looks like this. So, here's argc, here's argv0, which is null, and here is argv1, because that's how pointers work in C. So it turns out argv1 is actually the first environment variable setting. You with me so far? Okay. If you start a process, you can control the process's environment variables. And pkexec, which is the thing that starts previous processes, it can do that. Because it's set UID, it will check your environment and it'll throw away certain environment variables that might be exploitable. And there are some, right? Maybe I want to do something perverse with the path so that a process I'm running finds the wrong executables and runs my malicious executables instead of the right ones. Or maybe I change the library load path. That's, there's a couple of variables that control that. So instead of linking with the standard library, you link with my library that contains malicious code and you run that. So there's lots of things I might try to do. Uh, and we don't want any of that. So pkexec and certain other things, they police that. And it turns out you can control what environment is passed uh, when you exec a process. So, are there malicious environment variables? There are. LD preload is one of my favorite ones. If I can get an LD preload setting and point it to my malicious library, <laughs> now the jig is up, right? I can replace printf or malloc or whatever I want with my own version that does whatever I want it to do, which doesn't have to have anything to do with mallocing or printing. It can erase your hard drive. Who knows what, what I do? So those are bad. We don't want those to be set. Okay, let's go back to our code and think about this for a minute. So, so what happens? So we know a little bit more about what happens now. We come in here and n gets to be one. We check here. This is going to be null, right? Argv of argc, which is zero, so argv zero will be null. Argv of one, it's not going to be null. It's going to be the first environment variable setting, which, by the way, comes to you in the form name, an equal sign character, and then the value. So it comes to you in that string form. So that's what we're going to see. We're going to duplicate that string and put it in path, and path will not be null. Unless we fail to get memory, I guess. Uh, so it's going to be some path. And so we won't do this code because path is not null. 
we will go and check the beginning of it to see if the beginning of it is slash, and it probably won't be, right? Because I can't think of any environment variables whose name starts with a slash. So it's not gonna be that. So we're gonna then drop into here and do this code in here. We're going to try to find that string. So even though that string holds an environment variable setting, we can, it's just a string. It's just a string. And so we can say, is there a program with this name in my path? And if there is, I will save that to S. I'll free up the path. And then I will replace that setting with a pointer to the new value. Okay. All right. So I'm just replacing that, replacing that eight byte pointer with a different eight byte pointer that points somewhere else. Okay. So at this point, what have we done? We've read an environment variable. We have looked for it in the path. And then down here, we've modified the environment variables. We've modified it by setting the first environment variable setting to whatever we have in S. We could potentially have modified an environment variable and that's a bad thing. That's a security weakness. Okay, but how do I exploit that? This had to find the program in my path. And if it does, it's gonna have like a slash in front. It's gonna be weird, so that's not gonna work. What do I do? How do I, is there a way to even use that? Well, before we get to that, <clears throat> Let's think about this. Before PKExec does anything, it actually runs some code to clean up the environment variables. And it limits them to a very small list. So we go and make a new array called the saved environment. And then we run over the environment variables. And you'll notice that what we're doing here is we're saying n equal to zero, and environment variables to save n not equal null, n plus plus. So we're looking for that null terminator. We get the next one, and we just shove that all in the key. Why? Because that's where it comes to us. The string is name, equal character, value. And so we have this value, but we don't know what it is yet, because right now everything is in this string for key. I've omitted some code, but basically we, we break it apart uh, into, we look for that equal sign, the first equal sign, and then we divide the string up into two pieces. We set value to be the correct value. We mod we, we null terminate uh, the result for key, and now we have the key and the value. And there's this comment. This comment is actually in the code, and it says to qualify for the paranoia gold star, we validate the value of each environment variable to avoid exploits in potentially broken programs launched by PKExec because the problem is always other people's code. So we do an invalidation. If it fails validation, we go to out. Go to? Yeah, there's go to's in the program. There's go to's in lots of programs. Don't worry about it. Lots of people use go to. And if we pass validation, then we add it back to the environment and, and life is good. That comment's not going to age well. All right. Let's take a look at a different piece of this. Uh, if Paul kid authorization result get dismissed, and this is actually the argument to this function result, it just wrapped. Then we write a log message, and we have a return value, otherwise log message, so on. And you'll notice we're using g print error to print the error. If there's an error message, pkexec needs to print it out using use the gprinter from the GNU libraries. We can cause an error to be printed after the path is created. So search for a, G, a convenient print error after the path is assigned to argv1, which of course is envp0. And this just prints a string, so there's no problem with it. Right? It's getting a little bit, I know we're getting a little bit deep into this, but stay with me. We potentially modified an environment variable, and now we're going to find a place where it prints an error. It turns out 
that if their character set, char set, is not set to UTF-8, then it has to go and re-encode the string. But, and char set's not privileged. It's not a security risk. It's left in when you clean and sanitize the variable list because you need to use the correct character set. And since it's not a vulnerability, we don't erase it. And I can set char set to be whatever I want it to be. But that's okay, right? It's just a string. I would recommend this wonderful post by Joel on Software. The absolute minimum every software developer absolutely positively must know about Unicode and character sets. No excuses. It's wonderful. Uh, I'd recommend that you take a look at it sometime in your leisure. It's not required for the class, but it's good to know this stuff. Gprintr calls the glibc, that's the GNU standard library, it calls the function iconv open, and it does that to convert from UTF-8 to whatever character set we specified. Are there places in the world where you don't use UTF-8? There are. You might use UTF-16 because you're Windows, you might use any number of different character sets, and you have to convert. And so we got to convert. We we've got to transcode the string to the new character encoding. Okay, UTF-8 is. I don't know how people. I don't want to get too deeply into this, but UTF-8 is a way of representing Unicode characters, and it's a variable length encoding. So, a Unicode character can take up to, I believe the current one is 32 bits. That's four bytes. Uh, not every character needs four bytes. So uh, what we do is we compromise in some way. Windows gives you two bytes and a special character to get the other two if you need them. But UTF-8 is really clever. UTF-8 encodes most characters as a single byte. And then some as two bytes and some as three bytes, so on to get the full uh, the full amount. It's a clever encoding and we might need to convert from it to something else. And we use a program to do that. Icon open is the one that we use. Okay, this seems fine. We just convert. To convert between character sets, Icon open uses small shared libraries. So you write your encoder as some C code and you compile it and you put it in a shared object file and you put it somewhere out there and then when the system runs at runtime it uses gcon the gconv path environment variable to find the transcoder library okay so let's sum up again program runs it has to print an error string to print the error string, it needs to check the char set. If the character set is not UTF-8, it needs to go and get a converter. It finds the appropriate converter in the gconv path using that environment variable, loads it, and runs it. So what do I do? I want to put a malicious encoder in that path. If I can do that, the error message runs. My malicious encoder runs and it can do whatever it wants to do. It doesn't have to just convert characters. Again, it can, you know, erase your hard drive, send me a send me a text message, whatever it wants to do. Well it turns out this is a known problem. We know gconv path is a potential weakness. And so when we run a set UID program, the dynamic linker, LD.S, so that's the thing that loads and runs a chunk of code cleans up the environment to prevent the bad things from happening. Uh, and so any potential uh, gconv path is removed. That's right, I say any potential. Any gconv path setting at all is removed from the environment so that you just use the, whatever the defaults are for your system. So it's not, in the, it's not there. There's no environment variable for gconv path. But there could be, right? I could use my trick from earlier. If I could use my trick from earlier, where I grabbed argv1 
and then sh made a change to it and shoved it back, if I could use that to trick the system into putting gconv path in the environment variable list, pointing to my malicious decoders and then trigger an error, I own the system. Can I do that? Is that something I could do? Well, here's how I did it. This is at the time I did this, there were no published exploits, so I had to puzzle this all out on my own. And I didn't do it the same way as a lot of other people did it. Some of them did it in a simpler way. It, so go online and, and take a look if you want. But this is how I did it, and it worked for me. I create a folder named gconv underscore path equal dot. That's a string of characters. That can be a folder name in, in Linux. Why can't it be? Sure it can be. And then I add a file called friend, name doesn't matter, uh, in that folder. So now I have a folder called gconf path equal dot and a file called friend in there. So the whole path is gconf underscore path equal dot slash friend. That's the path to the file. And then I specify a char set. And now, and you can see over here, I've got my own char set that I created, which I called Wordle, because I needed a name for it. And Wordle was the big thing at, the, at that time, so I just called it Wordle. And look at here, here's how I'm setting things up. My argv is still empty, so my argc is gonna be zero, so I can exploit that weakness. And then my environment contains these settings. And notice, these are actual environment variable settings, because they have equals in them. This isn't, because it doesn't have to be. The notion that it's name equal value is a convention that I can ignore. And it's an alternative. And then I use exec C V E. The E means I'm passing you an environment. Again, that's how the environment gets to processes. Okay. So now I invoke PK exec. My argc is zero. The path is constructed. E and VP zero is equal to friend. And a search path that matches gconf underscore path equal dot updating the environment as follows so why do i say a search path that's that look at my path is set to so it's going to look for friend and it's going to look for it in the path and the path only contains this folder name right this equal separates the variable name from the value and the value happens to contain an equal that's fine so it's going to look for gconf underscore path equal dot and it's going to look for friend inside there, and it's going to find it. And when it finds it, it's going to return this as the result. gconv underscore path equal dot slash friend. <laughs> All right. Now I create a folder named friend, and I put a copy of the gconv modules file that you can find on your system in there. And then I create a malicious converter module, and that's it right there, and I drop it in the friend folder. A converter has to have an init and an end and a convert, and I could have put my malicious code in any of them. I put it in convert. It could have been put in an init. It doesn't matter. I don't care what these things do. Again, I'm not trying to convert anything. Uh, and what my converter does is it sets argv to bash, the actual name I'm about to execute, it sets the shell and the path, and it gives me a little basic path. These are, you know, there's no, there's a comma here, but there's no comma here, so these strings get concatenated. There's my terminating null. And then I do a set UID zero, set GID zero. This sets my effective user ID to root, my effective group ID to the group zero, which is root. And then I do an exec VE with it, and there we go. So this should start the bash shell as root. And I'm allowed to do these because this process is running as root, right? But it's running with an effective user ID of root. If it starts another process, that process will have the effective ID of the correct, of the real user ID, which is still my, ID, my user ID. And so I explicitly set these down here. I have to do that uh, so that the subordinate process has the root uh, user ID. And if this works, I get a root prompt. And I just put this in this friend folder that's in my gconf path and trigger an error. That's it. That's all I have to do. It would be great if someone had known this. 
maybe some years ago, maybe in 2013, and warned us about it. And in fact, someone had. This is a blog post that's out there in the world that got a lot of attention, where he said, most C programmers should be aware that the argv argument domain is a null terminated list of strings. The first term is the name of the program, but on Linux there's a feature that allows the list to be empty. It's not true on all operating systems. Some of them actually do enforce this, but Linux doesn't. And so there you go. And it says, this is non-standard and non-portable. It should result in an e-fault. On Linux it doesn't. But we can now execute a program with this. And it turns out that might be bad. While I haven't found any potential exploits using this, at the time there was one, there was you know, policy kit had been written the previous year, so he could have, he just didn't look maybe hard enough, but that's okay. Can't fault him for this. It does allow for some amusing behavior from set UID binaries. So there you go. All right. And so that is an example of a bunch of things. Combining different types of weaknesses to subvert the protections for them, right? Some of those are known and there are protective measures around them, but I'm able to subvert them and combine them to escalate privilege. It's also a case where there are some conventions, but nothing is enforcing those conventions. Nothing's making sure that I'm following them. And so it's fine for me to break them. Something important to think about. So let's think about protection of programs. Let's think about physical protection of systems. So physical protection focuses usually on defending an area, right? I want to protect this, this military base, or I want to protect this building, or I want to protect this room. Or you could be protecting an item, right? I have a beagle, and so I'm always protecting someone's food from the beagle well, you know, they went to the bathroom or whatever, and they're like, protect my food! And so I, I protect their food from the beagle uh, who's ever-present. Uh, or I could be protecting a person, right? I mean, you have bodyguards that, that surround the person that try to protect them. And I want to use multiple approaches. And the approaches I typically use are the ones over there on the right. Deter, detect, delay, respond, and neutralize. So what do those really mean? Deterrence uh, means that I want to prevent action through a credible threat, right? Maybe my nation creates nuclear weapons or I have a nuclear deterrent. Or maybe I just put a guy, a menacing looking guy in front of the door. And you're like, I probably shouldn't mess with that guy. He looks tougher than me, so I'm gonna leave him alone, okay? That guy standing there with the gun and the, and the vest, you know, looking tough, He's, deter he's there to deter you. I mean, he's not going to, he wouldn't necessarily stop you. He's there to say, hey, look, you might try this, but it may not go well for you. So I want to deter you from, from trying to break in here or steal something or do whatever you want to do. Okay. The idea is that the potential cost to me outweighs whatever gain I might get from this, right? I, maybe I could take the guy. I feel confident I can't, but maybe I could. Who knows? So I got to wait. I got to make that decision, and it's usually going to deter me from taking that action. I'll wait till he goes to a bathroom break, and then I'll I'll uh, I'll do it. Detection. Detection is the positive assessment that a specific object caused an alarm, or the announcement of a potential malevolent act through alarms. So in other words, I set up alarms. Maybe I have pressure plates. You step on the pressure plate, I get an alarm. Maybe I have infrared sensors. You step through the beam, I get an alarm. Maybe I have motion detectors. Maybe I have thermal detectors. Maybe I have cameras pointed and people sitting watching the cameras. And those, you know, those can all cause an alarm. And generating a detection, which may cause you to run away, or it may cause you know, other people to run towards you, but it, it's a way of, of defending it. I might try to delay you. A delay tactic is something, some technical device or a security measure or, or something that, that slows you down to give me time to detect you and to respond. 
so the picture there shows a padlock. The padlock is there to delay you, right? Padlocks aren't an impenetrable, perfect security. Fences aren't, walls aren't, doors aren't, locks of any kind aren't. They are there to slow you down. They are there to delay you, okay? That padlock, probably very, very easy to open that padlock. If not, uh, look right above the padlock. There's a nut on that little bolt that holds that whole thing on. If I've got a socket wrench, maybe I can be in faster than I can pick the lock, right? Sometimes people put locks in hilarious places where you think to themselves, why did you think that was going to prevent anything? And, and there you go. Uh, so it's there to slow you down. It's there to slow you down. Can I cut through the hasp of that lock? Do I have to? Can I cut through the wire of the fence? That's probably easier. <laughs> All right. Response, right? What happens when the alarm goes off? The alarm goes off and you're trying to get through the gate that's padlocked and that gives me time to get people there. Physical response to predetermined locations based on the alarm information with the force to stop you from from getting any further, right? I'm not sending one guy, I'm sending three guys because they can physically carry you away. Problem, problem addressed, right? That's my response, okay? So those are the things that I might apply to it. The final one is to neutralize the threat. This one's a little different from some of the others. Uh, the idea is I want to render you incapable of doing whatever it is you're gonna do, right? And that could be, you know, I drop you in a hole, I handcuff you and sit you in the corner, or I trap you in what you see over on the right-hand side here. That's a man trap. Uh, that's a box. You have to go into the box to get in or to get out. If you've visited some high-end jewelry stores, you've had to go through these. And let's say you run in, you wave your gun around. I'm like, fine, take the stuff. You take all the stuff. You put it in a bag and you run through the first door and you are now locked in. And it's got bulletproof glass and the alarms go off and you're trapped there until the police come and they hang out outside and wait till you get tired and then they just take you away at their leisure. Okay. I want you to notice something about all this. Failure is anticipated. We, we think to ourselves, hey, this might not work. It might, we might fail to detect you. You might not be slowed down. We have to have other systems and processes there to protect it. So nothing in here was an absolute. I didn't say this is the shield of steel that will forever prevent you from getting this, right? None of that is, right? Things either slow you down or they respond to the threat in some way or they try to make you not try it in the first place. And that's kind of it. We have a notion of failure built in. What do you do when each one of these systems fails in some way? So we can think about our cyber stuff. We typically think about confidentiality, integrity, availability, authentication, and non-pediation. And we might try to map these to each other. That seems like a thing we might try. And if you try it, you'll get this figure here, which I love. This figure actually comes from a publication that cited in the end. This is their figure one where they try to do the mapping. And I feel like, <laughs> I feel like this is somehow, you know, this is somehow less than useless. <laughs> this sort of is the kind of figure that I would look at it and think, oh, they made a figure. And then I would go on and, and probably never think of it again, except to, to put it up as, a, as something to, to chuckle about. But you see, they don't, they don't map in a nice, clean way. And that means that people who do physical security, people who do cybersecurity, often talk past each other. And so when we, when we think about systems where you need both to work together, it becomes very hard to make that happen because the experts in each field are thinking about the world a little differently. Let's switch gears and think about cyber protection. So in cyber protection, we have... Uh, the NIST five functions, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Those are the five functions from the NIST framework. NIST is the National Institute of Science and Technology, uh, and this is the NIST cybersecurity framework. 
what do these mean? Well, there's the identify function, and we can read all this text on here, and I encourage you to read lots of text. The basic question is, what are you protecting? NIST advises you to first figure out what you're actually trying to protect, <laughs> and then take steps to protect that thing, right? Oftentimes in cybersecurity, we think we have to protect everything. Everything has to have all the protections to the highest level, because anything we don't protect, right? A threat to security anywhere is a compromise to all security, right? Security is binary, all these things that, that, that are in our head about security, you know, rightly so, but we do need to think, what is it I'm really trying to protect? And then there's a protect function. So once you've figured out what you're gonna protect, then you just protect it, right? Well, not exactly. This asks, how will you protect things? Will you, will you, you know, take the secret, put it in a secure envelope, put that envelope in a safe, hurl the safe into the ocean, hurl the ocean into the sun? Is that your plan to protect it? What are the ways in which you're going to protect the thing? Detect, obviously, how are you gonna detect when someone is tampering with it, and that's it. How do you detect intrusions and tampering? Respond. When you detect intrusions and tampering, what do you do? Like, how will you respond to a detection? Will you just go, oh, that's nice. No, you should have a plan that says, okay, I've detected this thing. I have to know what that means, right? If you're sitting in a, in a security operations center in a SOC and your SIM, your, the thing that's pulling all the security events in and displaying them, has a, det has a detection, I, do I need to respond to that? Is someone else going to respond to that? Is there an automated response for that? Does it even matter? Maybe it's a false alarm. I have to think about what I'm going to do. And then finally, recover. Because it's going to fail. People are going to get around all this. They're going to get whatever it is you're trying to protect or get access to it. And they might break things. And now I need to recover from that. So how will I recover from a breach? What's my process, policies, all of that? How will I do that? That could even include training to make sure that the particular breach doesn't happen again. Okay. So those are the five functions. And so we have two different ways of thinking about the security of systems and, and how to protect them. Physical protection, deter, detect, delay, respond, neutralize. Protection is usually built inside out, right? I say, I'm gonna protect this widget and I'm gonna put the widget in a safe, put the safe at the bottom of the ocean, hurl the ocean into the sun, right? I think from the inside out. Cyber protection is usually built in layers from the outside in, right? They're on the unclean internet, so I've gotta put firewalls at my gateways and then I may put layers of protection inside that, uh, but ultimately, I want people to move quickly through that if they're authorized. Over on the left-hand side, I, I want to slow everybody down. Right? You've got to stop and unlock this with a physical key. Enter some information on a keypad while you're standing in front of a camera. I'm slowing you down so that we can detect malicious activity. On the right, I, I want to get my thing now. It's cyber, it's computers, it should be fast. And so I have to be able to quickly move through these, these different layers uh, to get to the thing I'm trying to get to. You see there's a bit of a tension here. Can we use any of the stuff in software design? Yes. Some lessons that are common across this is divide complex systems into layers with different access policies, right? That's clearly what's done in facilities, right? I mean, you might be able to walk onto a military base or some that don't have external fences you can walk on. But maybe there are parts that are fenced and then maybe there are buildings that have protection on those buildings. And maybe there are even more protected rooms inside those buildings. And so I have to think about different layers of security and different security boundaries, and maybe there are different approaches to this. We can do the same thing on networks, right? We segment up networks to try to limit your ability to move laterally through the system. We can delay certain actions. That actually, we do that, right? We, when you've got your iPhone and you're trying to unlock it and you've forgotten your pen, you may try it a couple times and then it says, you can try again in one minute. 
You try it again, it's like you can try again in five minutes, right? We're slowing you down, we're delaying uh, so that we can prevent you from brute forcing something. And that's a common tactic. And we can try to neutralize a threat by locking the software if security properties are violated or even by destroying the data entirely. And we'll talk about that in a future class. All right, so there's some things we can take away from this. I think it's important to think about physical security, cybersecurity, try to put them both in your head, uh, understand the mindsets uh, because it's going to help you. And systems are increasingly blended systems. The power grid is a system of physical uh, controls governed by, by network connections and cyber components. Okay. The minimum set of questions you should be able to answer when you're thinking about your secure program. What are you trying to protect? Who are you trying to protect it from? Is it me? Well, then you gotta maybe think hard, but not terribly hard. Is it a nation state? Then maybe you have to think a lot harder, okay? And for how long are you trying to protect it? Nothing's perfect, nothing lasts forever, right? The NSA likes to rank crypto systems by how long they expect those messages to remain secure. The highest level of security could give you many years of protection for that message, but even they know eventual failure. Things eventually fail, right? It's true for physical systems. Eventually, your tires wear out in your car and you have to have new ones. Eventually, something in your car breaks. Eventually, something in your computer breaks. Eventually, security itself uh, breaks. And so, how long are you trying to protect it? And this helps you answer the question of how to protect it. And then, of course, What's your plan for when the protective measures fail? For each measure you're putting in, what's your plan for when that measure fails? Okay, things to think about. Let's go to part two. Let's talk about threat modeling. So threat modeling tries to take some of the stuff we just talked about and make it more concrete. What are the threats to your system? Right, so what are you building, what can go wrong, what should you do about the things that can go wrong, and have you done enough analysis? That's that fourth step. The answer to that's almost certainly always no, but eventually you can say yes because I'm tired. Right, okay. So what are the threats? You find them using a process called threat modeling. This is a process of examining your system and, and trying to think hard about the different ways that things could go wrong. And threat modeling can be ad hoc, right? You can just sit and look at it and say, I think someone could try this or they could try that or maybe this could happen. That's fine. It could be guided. So you could say, I'm going to look at each component or I'm going to think about each kind of connection or each kind of user or each uh, use case. Uh, it's, and it could be guided in that way. It could be a card game. We'll talk about that in a moment. Or you could use maybe a more systematic process. And we'll talk about that too different ways of doing threat modeling to figure out what are the threats that I need to account for when I build my system or when I re-architect it or whatever I'm doing. First one, what are you building? Right? Identify the components of your system and how they interoperate. Right? What's a component? Well, it could be a module of your system. It could be a, a piece like I'm going to use a SQL database. Or I'm going to use a NoSQL database, or I'm going to be putting stuff up in a uh, in Dropbox, and I'm using a Dropbox connector to do that, and that's a component. Figure out what the components of your system are and how they interoperate. Vulnerabilities often occur at the interfaces, and they often occur when some possible inputs are not properly handled. Right? Maybe someone's putting something in a field in your web application. You need to sanitize that field. Maybe it's occurring when a convention is violated. Right? These are the three things I told you earlier. Think about each one of those, right? I expect a, a uh, request coming in to have this shape to it, but nothing guarantees that it does. I can add stuff to a URL. I can add stuff to a post request, etc. And this tells us a bit about what we need to include in the, in the picture. And, and I would recommend you draw it as a picture, right? Show me what these things are and where the information flows are. Identify significant components with boxes. 
connect the boxes with arrows wherever there's an interface and label the arrows with the data or the information or the control that flows along that line. This is computer science because computer science is the study of boxes and arrows and so that's what we're going to do. That's how we're going to do the analysis. And this is also a kind of requirements analysis. It requires that you think about the system you're trying to build, which is good. Try to consider different stuff that can go wrong with each part of the diagram. What if someone sends bad data or data's lost or something fails or you run out of memory or something misbehaves? And you know, you could go on with this kind of thinking forever. And but there are different ways to prompt you to think about this and one of them is a card game and there is in fact a a threat modeling card game some of the cards are shown over on the right there uh, and it gives you a game to play and uh, it gives you a way to think about the different threats to your system so you can see denial of service and spoofing and repudiation up there it's a common uh, common weaknesses in systems you can download it for free uh, and there are games that run you know, all the time that you can just hop into and, and join if you're curious about this. Okay, so now we've thought about the things that can go wrong. We drew a picture, we looked at the picture, we figured out what was on there. What do we do about the things that can go wrong? So for everything we figured out that might be wrong, we have to think about how we're going to handle it. And some of the things you can do are over on the right. I might add code to detect something is wrong, right? I might just validate the input. You give me a number, I check to see if it's in range. If it's out of range, I give an error. I might add code that prevents trouble, okay? So you give me a string, I sanitize the string so that it's safe to use later on. It won't trigger some weird behavior, like with the log4j that we talked about before. I might change the architecture, right? I might think, well, you know, this is a weak spot, but so instead of using this thing, I might use this other library that's more secure. Maybe it's harder to use and I hadn't planned to use it, but now I see there's a problem and I really do want to use it. Or maybe I'm like, well, information, this kind of information should flow here because I really need to protect it, so I'm not going to provide that. I maybe just provide a link or something else. I might change the problem. I might decide that what I'm trying to do, all the different things that I'm, I'm trying to build into this, some of them are nice features, but they incur more risk than I want, and so I remove them. I'm developing a video game, but I realize that part of it needs to run in a privileged way, and maybe that provides someone with a privilege elevation opportunity. And so I ask myself, is there a way I can eliminate that privilege code? And maybe I remove a feature that, that eliminates that. Uh, there have been cases where systems were deployed that sort of automatically update themselves. Maybe that's, maybe I don't wanna do that. Maybe I wanna go find somebody who has a good secure auto update system and just use it or maybe I want to remove that because I'm worried about it being exploited. Maybe I look at it and say, you know what, that's an issue. Um, but if you, the user, have set your configuration correctly, it won't, it won't be a problem. And so what I do is I document it and I tell you, hey, you better go and set this environment variable or unset this environment variable or do something else about your system to protect it. Be sure, and, be sure and close this port or whatever. Uh, so it's documented. And then finally I look at it and go, yep, that's a problem. And maybe in the future I'll fix it or maybe not. And I ignore it. That's a, that is in fact a conscious decision you can make to say, you know what? It seems like something I'm not gonna care about. But you have to think about this. And companies, when they're releasing software, they think like this, right? And sometimes the answer is, I'm going to release the software because I have a hard release date for it to meet my market window. I'm going to ignore the issue. Right? I'm, going to, I'm going to show you this car. And it has to be ready in time for this big thing in Detroit. Yeah, there's an issue, but you know what? I'll fix it in the future. I'll fix it on recall or something else. Okay. 
All right. And then, of course, the question, have you done enough analysis? The answer is always no. <laughs> the threat landscape is always evolving. And so sometimes it's good to go back and redo the analysis when you have new information. System changes, you should take another look at it. Something your system depends on changes, right? New release of Log4j, maybe take a look at it. New threats emerge, take a look at it. Maybe you have time and you're bored and you want to take a look at it. Are you always going to do this? Probably not. But, and if you did, you might not catch it, right? You may go, well, Log4j changed, but it's a feature that I don't care about or use, so I'm not going to worry about it. So, you know, even when you're doing this in a good faith, conscientious way, there's still a lot of risk here. You need to just be aware of that and understand that. Perfect security is impossible. It is my bottom line to all of this. You can't list all the threats because some threats rely on knowledge you don't have and cannot reasonably get. Paul Kidd is vulnerable to this RC0 thing. Who knew that, right? This one guy with a blog knew it. Log4j has this new feature that is exploitable. Who knew that? For a lot of years, no one did, and then suddenly everyone did. So, you know, do the best you can, but, but understand that you will, you will fail. Okay. There's homework that's due on the 6th. Uh, I want you to go over to GitHub or GitLab or whatever other open source site you want. I want you to find a project uh, and I want you to build a diagram of some part of, or maybe all of the project. So identify the major components. This has a database, a web server, all these other things. Identify the components. Maybe it's just a collection of libraries. Okay, that's fine. Maybe it's a bunch of objects. Don't care. Identify the components uh, and build a diagram like we talked about earlier. I'll write the slide on the diagram and it'll tell you what needs to be in it. Using that, uh, yeah. Using that diagram, identify some potential threats. Try to find at least three. Think maliciously. Okay, I want you to think like an attacker. We'll talk more about how to do that later, but, but just get it. It's like, I'm going to break this thing, or I'm going to break the security of it. Try to think of ways you can do it. They can be things that cause the program to generate bad output, or they could just break it so it just doesn't work. That's, that's achieving something too, right? Submit the diagram and the threats you found. There's more information on the on the uh, on the uh, assignment side. There you go.